Hi, this is Andy and Sharon McClellan from Father's House. Welcome to this teaching session. We pray that you will be blessed and grow as a result of listening today. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I just bless you, Sharon, that you just give out of the depths of your spirit that goodness and that, that amount that God has placed within you, mm. that message that bubbles up, bubbles up, that it will bubble out of you and touch others. Sure. That the goodness of God would just go and touch others and excite the hearts of those, even sure. those that have become sort of right. a little bit sure. dulled, a little da, da, bit da, da. offbeat, but yet they need reawakened, they need refired yeah. uh, with the message and the truth of the gospel. So we bless you today mm. with this message, sure. Sharon, in Jesus' name. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, welcome. I'm just going to get up on my Facebook here. Also, I'm going to share. If you haven't shared yet, get it shared on Facebook page. Um, yeah, share onto your Facebook page just so that others get to, um, to benefit from what the word that's coming out this morning so welcome welcome to all our church family online and welcome to uh all those that are on facebook this morning that are watching alongside us we just want to welcome you to this message this morning to this this time together this teaching together and this is resurrection day and we are like pumping we are like so excited um, about what God is going to say, uh, just the message that the Lord has really put in my heart this morning. Um, I'm just, I'm just buzzing this morning with just what I've been just soaking in over the last week. So um, it's the day of atonement. It's the the time of the ransom. The ransom. What does it mean to be ransomed? What does it mean to to celebrate the atonement? Well, ransom, the definition of the word ransom is the money or price paid to redeem a slave or prisoner or for goods captured by an enemy to be brought back, to release something or someone from their current outcome or uh, their current outcome by an outside force. So someone that is held and there's a ransom that is paid to set that person free. Also, atonement the word for atonement, the definition of that is the process by which people remove obstacles to their reconciliation with God. So there's a process that enables us to have to be reconciled back to God, that our broken relationship that was broken way back in the garden before we were born, that 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 those obstacles that are in place, the atonement is the process by which we overcome those obstacles through God and have reconciliation again with God, with our father, with amazing daddy. So in scripture, ransom, the word ransom and the word atonement are interchangeable throughout the whole of scripture because they're rooted in the same word. And that Hebrew word is kapar. It's spelled K-A-P-P-E-R, but it's pronounced copper. And that's in the Old Testament Hebrew. And then in the Greek, in the New Testament, it's the word latrun. And those two words are completely interchangeable because they're founded and rooted in the same root word, the same original roots. So whether you're looking at atonement or ransom, they come right back to that same beginning. So atonement is like this constant recurring theme in history, especially, especially in religion. When you think of the peace child story, it's a story of African tribes that were at war continuously. They were just murdering, killing each other, trying to gain power over each other, trying to gain territory. And then the, the leaders of the tribes came together and they said, how can we bring peace uh, between our tribes? And what they did was they exchanged their firstborn. They exchanged their babies. So the, 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 each tribal leader gave their child to the other tribe. 
And they knew that they would look after this child really well because their child was being looked after by the other tribe. And as long as that child was healthy and well and happy, peace was uh, brought between the tribes. So there was the sacrifice of a, tri of a tribal child of children that were given to bring peace in the midst of war, to bring peace between the tribes where they could live together. And so the atonement brought about by, by Jesus, by Yeshua, is the most important event ever that happened in human history. It is like the most important event because Jesus came, he came as a baby, he lived, but if he hadn't have gone to the cross and died and resurrected, it wouldn't have made any difference. So all that he would have done would just have been a story. So it's a huge statement that the atonement is the most important event ever. So let's look at why. Let's look at why. Why is the atonement the greatest event in history? So to, to look at this, we have to go back to right to the beginning to Genesis 3, verses 22 and 24. And that's where God planted Adam and Eve in the garden. And he created a place. So he created the world. He created everything in it. Then he created a garden on the east of the earth and the place of the east, which is very interesting because he's coming back to the east. Jerusalem's in the east. So he planted this garden in the east and that garden was called Eden. So God created Eden to be an eternal place of dwelling with man. It's the place where God and man could be together all the time. They could talk, they could walk, they could commune together. And actually, the definition of Eden is a place of pleasure, a place of delight, a place of luxury and finery, life forever, paradise or heaven. Let me say that again. Eden is the place of pleasure, a place of delight, a place of inexpressible joy, a place of luxury and finery, a place of life forever a place of paradise and a place of heaven. Who wants to live there? Woo, come on. I want to be there. I want to be there. That sounds like a place where anyone who, who has any common sense whatsoever is a place where you would want to live, yeah? A place of joy and pleasure and delight and finery and luxury, you know? And, and it's like there's something in our human spirit that knows that we're made for more isn't there? There's something in you that knows that you were made to be beautiful, to be strong, to be full of pleasure and full of joy. There's this pleasure seeking radar inside of us that says, I'm going to seek out some happiness and I'm going to seek out some pleasure. And actually, even like to, to go out for coffee and cake brings this incredible joy to us. And yet, yet, the word tells us that God has this place, right? So that came to earth, that he formed on earth, and yet that was withdrawn because of sin. So that place of pleasure, that place of paradise, that place of dwelling with God, that place of uh, ecstatic joy and finery and luxury was shut down, locked away because of man's sin. So when you think about the thief on the cross and, and Jesus said to him, today, where you will be with me, where? In paradise. And that word paradise is the word Eden. So when he said, today, you will be with me in paradise, he said to him, today, you will be with me in Eden. Today you will be with me in Eden. And that man, that Jewish man would have known exactly, exactly what Jesus was talking about. He would have known that he was being restored onto that place of communion with God, onto that place of joy, that place of dwelling in the presence of God. That's what he was saying to him at that moment that he was dying. Hey, guy, 
All your sin is gone. I am restoring you today, your relationship with Jesus. You will not suffer a spiritual death, but you will come again into the place of paradise with me to be forever, ever with God. Such a powerful, powerful word. So he was given an eternal position right at that point when he thought he'd lost everything. God restored everything to him in a moment. When you look at Sarah, Abraham's wife, in Genesis 18, verse 12, when she had been told that she was going to have another baby, right, or, or a baby, she hadn't been able to, she was barren. And here was the angel of the Lord came and said, hey, through your wife, Sarah, I'm going to make you more numerous than what you can see in the stars in the sky. And, and Sarah turned around and she said, what? In verse 12, she says, what? Did you know that was in the Bible? What? She said, after I'm worn out, after my Lord is old, will I have delight? Let me say that again. Sarah said, what? After I'm worn out, after my Lord is old, will I have delight? And the Hebrew translation of that says, will I have Eden? Will I have Eden? Am I going to be brought into a place of inexpressible joy? Am I going to be brought into that place where I feel God's communion again upon my life? That place of, of intimacy, not just with my husband, but with the creator of the world, where I will find the pleasure of God again through childbirth, through a son being given to me. So that word delight is also Eden, the same word as, uh, as paradise, which is uh, paradisos in Greek, but coming from the same root word as Eden. And then we look at Revelation 2, chapter 7, at the end of the age, right? At the end of the age, at the end of this age, moving into the age to come, come on, which we're getting so close to right now. We have Revelation 2, 7. It says to the one who is victorious, that is you. You're going to be the victorious ones. You're going to be the ones that pursue and run the race and, and finish well. And he says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in what? The paradise of God, which is in the Eden of God. I will give the right to eat the tree of life. What was the thing that he blocked Adam and Eve from? What was the thing he set the cherubim in place for? Those, those angels with flaming swords. What was it he blocked them from? The tree of life. What is it we get to eat from? What is it he gives us permission and access to and legal right to? The tree of life. So it's going to come a time when we actually step in. I believe we're going to step in and eat the fruit of that tree. And I know we have eternal life like right now through Christ. But I also believe in Revelation 2, 7 to the one who is victorious because we still have battles to pursue. We still have things to overcome. He said, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the Eden of God. Come on, heaven, paradise, delight, luxury, finery, beauty, ecstatic joy. So at the end of the age, we will be welcomed into Eden. We will be welcomed into paradise, to heaven, to eat of the tree of eternal life in that amazing, amazing place. So nipping back again to Exodus chapters 19 to 24 is when a covenant was established between God and Israel that they decided they needed the law. They needed some rules and regulations. So God went, oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. So chapters 19 to 24 of Exodus give us this, uh, this uh, the details of the covenant law that was made between God and man right back then. And then in Exodus chapter 25, verse 20, the instructions were given for the Ark of the Covenant. 
the Ark of the Covenant, verses 17 to 20, he says, make an atonement cover. This is like right at the start of the, the word for atonement. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, three, quarter, three and three quarter feet long, two and a quarter foot wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub uh, on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward and overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. And, and I thought the cherubim, I used to think the cherubim were like these lovely little fluffy baby angels, you know, that floated around the place. So I kind of thought, I need to look at this and see what, what's happening here. So the cherubim, the, the Hebrew word for cherubim is, is cherub, which means angelic beings and flaming swords. So I was thinking, oh, my gosh, so the cherubim are the angels with the flaming sword. So they're the ones that guard. They're the ones that that will um, attack. They're the ones that will protect. They're the ones that will block. So they're defensive and offensive. Amazing, huge angels with huge flaming swords. So. And then I thought, well, if they've got flaming swords, when you think of the flame, the fire, it speaks of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the fire of God, doesn't it, that has been released into the, these angelic beings in order that they would guard and protect to be offensive and defensive. So it's like this, this flame is like this fire of the Holy Ghost. And then the sword, the word of God, the written, the prophetic word of God, the utterance of the Lord. You know where it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So we have these cherubim that guard the, uh, the doorway back to paradise, back to heaven. It's blocked by these angelic, huge angelic beings with the fire of God upon them and the word of God in the sword that they guard with. So they've guarded with the sword. It says, you know, because of your sin, you can't enter. Because of your the fall of man, you can't, there's no access here for you to the tree of life. So they were the guardians of Eden. And they surround the throne in Revelation 4, endless beings. And it, it speaks of them as being um, like living forever. So they're like eternal beings that they're, they're going to be there forever. And also they're like living water. So they have vital power in themselves and, and they exert that living water and they exert that, fat, that vital power to what surrounds them. So you have these incredible angelic beings that have the fire of God and the word of God and these swords that, that in themselves have this life vital power that they release to what is around them, this authority, this government right to execute the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the word of God in every place that they are put. So in Eden, in Genesis 2, 22 to 24, God forcibly, it says that he threw them out. And the, the power behind that word was like he literally took them by the scruff of the neck and he threw them out of the garden. He's like, I am done. You're out. You had, that's it. You broke it. It's out. He forcibly threw them out of the garden. And on the east side of the garden, he placed these cherubim with these flaming swords to guard the entry to the tree of life eternal. And that was put in place right back then. Uh, uh, and, and that has been in place until the atonement of Christ. That has been in place until the atonement of Christ. We're going to look at what happened and then how that 
has been executed. So when Adam fell, there were two deaths that happened. One, a literal physical death came into, into being where well, there was a there is a literal separation of body and spirit upon death. So one is the literal physical death was brought into being upon the fall of man. Secondly, there was a spiritual death, an actual separation from the presence of God. So in these two deaths, if, if these two deaths had not been overcome by Yeshua's atonement, there would be no reconciliation of the body and the spirit. There'd be no resurrection of the dead. There would be no resurrection, no reconciliation to live again with the father in the age to come. So it was a very powerful thing that happened because of a decision that they made to be disobedient. So a literal physical death and a spiritual death, one was a separation of the body and spirit upon death. Secondly, an actual separation eternally from God. That was put in place right back then until the atonement of Christ. So what happened? Jesus came. What happened? God had a plan. So in John 10, verses 17 to 18, Jesus said, the reason the father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And I have authority. I have authority to take it back up again. This command I received from my father. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I was thinking about this, right? Can you imagine like, having the power to say, okay, at, at 420, I'm going to die. I'm going to give up my life. I'm going to separate my spirit and soul from my body. And as far as everybody's concerned, I'm dead. That's it. They can bury me, whatever. And then in, at, you know, six o'clock in three days time, I'm going to take my body back up again. Can you imagine having that kind of power? Can you imagine, like he said, you know, nobody takes it from me. I lay it down and I have authority to take it back up. Jesus had the authority of resurrection in him and the choice to raise from the dead when he knew the time was right. And I believe that when the angel came and rolled that stone away, the spirit of Christ came and said, OK, body. It's time to come back to life again. Let's join up and let's get the heck out of here. Let's do something great. So he was the only one who could lay his life down and take it up again. He was the begotten of the father. Therefore, he had the power and authority over death. He was the most sinless of human beings, a fully sinless human man. And it was the father's love that drew him and called him to take this action. So John 3, 16, we know that verse, man, we're taught it from childhood, aren't we? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whosoever, I'm a whosoever, you're a whosoever. If you're watching today, you are a whosoever. And it says, God so loved you that he sent his only son, that if you believe in him, you will not die, but live forever. When you choose to believe in Jesus and you choose to surrender to Jesus, those angels part the way. They part the way to Eden for you. They part the way to heaven for you. There is eternal life that is birthed within you through the spirit of the living God. When you come to him and you say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe that you took my sin and my shame and all my mess ups, past, present and future. And I acknowledge that you are the Lord of all the earth, that you're the begotten son of the father. I acknowledge today that I am a sinner and I cannot access your presence without the blood of Jesus. And today, Father God, I come to you through Jesus, your son, Jesus, I accept all that you've done for me. Jesus, I accept that I cannot do this on my own. Jesus, I accept that you are the doorway back to the Father. 
and I give my life to you today. I surrender to you today. And he says to you today that whosoever, that if you believe in him, you will not die. You will not suffer a spiritual death and you will not suffer the literal death because your body will be restored at the end of the age and you will be reunited with God. You will not die, but you will live forever. If that's you today, and that's you, and you have given your life to Jesus today, and that revelation is yours today, and you've taken hold of that revelation, please, please write it in the little box below. Let us know in the comment box that you have surrendered your life today. If you're one that has known Christ and fallen away from Christ and turned your back on Christ, today is your resurrection day. Today is your atonement day. It is the day when you can turn around, the day when you can come back and say, Father, I messed up and I'm sorry. And I just surrender to you again today. If that's you, I bless you to know his beauty and his love and his goodness over you. Write in the comment box, say, today is my day. Today is resurrection day for me. Today is my day of surrender. Let us know, people. Let us know. We're so excited to hear that God is on the move in this season. Jesus gave up his life for you. His body is a living sacrifice for you to make atonement, to pay the price for your failure and your rebellion, to pay his debt, to pay your debt and free you from the bondage of spiritual and physical death. That is the power of who he is and his great, great love for you. You know, he didn't just die. There came a third day. There came a third day. Woo! And he rose from the dead. He took up his body again. The first resurrection, Matthew 28, verse 6, it says, he is not here. He has risen. He has risen. Revelation 22, verse 13, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Colossians 1, 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Acts 2, 23 to 24, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. With the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, but God, we know those two words, don't we? But God, you listening to me? But God raised him from the dead. Woo, come on, hallelujah. Oh my gosh, this is a day to get excited. If you're watching today, it's time to do, you know, like the, the Evan Almighty dance, you know, where he was like, woohoo! It's the day that God raised him from the dead. This is the day we celebrate that. We celebrate him. We celebrate his resurrection. And then why? Because so that, there's a so that. 1 Corinthians 15 says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Come on. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The ransom was paid. The atonement was paid. The Bible says all will be resurrected. All will be resurrected. There isn't one person that has ever lived or ever will live that will not be resurrected at the coming of Christ. Our, our spirit will be reunited. Our spirit will be reunited and a new body made. All will put on immortality. All. Those that know him, those that don't, will all put on immortality. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. So whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you will raise from the dead. There's going to come a day, whether you believe it or not, that Christ is coming home. And Eden is going to be restored here. 
and all will be raised from the dead. The atonement has been made and it made the impossible possible. It made the mortal become immortal, the perishable imperishable, that we would overcome spiritual death. So all will be resurrected, but only those who accept the atonement, only those who give their lives to Jesus, only those who walk in obedience to him and surrender to him will be saved from the spiritual death, eternal separation from God. So if you don't know Christ today, this is your day. This is your day. If you want to be with God, if you want to be brought together with God, this is your day. To, to step in to that place of knowing that you will have life eternal with him, not life eternal being separated. So how do we accept this atonement and this ransom, this divine exchange that's been made? One, we receive it by faith. We receive it by faith. Romans 3.25 says, God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood, received through faith faith is believing in what you cannot yet see so we receive that the 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 death and resurrection of christ we say god we believe we believe you're the son of god we believe that you died and rose again so that so that i can enter into that place of paradise that place of eternally dwelling with god that place of my sin forgiven and it says that he demonstrated his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. If you've given your life to Jesus, all the sin that you have committed, the shame, the things done to you, the things that you've said are all previous. They're all, all forgiven. God has passed over them and restored you into relationship with him. Ephesians 2 chapter 8 says you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. You can't do anything to enter into heaven or to have a relationship with God. This is all about grace. This is all about the goodness of God who loved you so much that he sent his son and he chose to crush him and he chose to put upon him all your stuff so that he took your punishment in order that you can have a relationship with your amazing father, God, who desires to walk in the garden with you again, who desires that intimacy and that relationship with you. It's time to repent. It's time to change your mindset. It's time to be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit and obey the words and commands of God. That's what it means to be in relationship with God. Romans chapter five says, let me just find it here. Romans chapter five. Thought I had it out, but I don't. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19, says this Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, in fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is the type of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by one man's trespass many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to many. And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by one man's trespass death reigned through that man, how much more? Will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through this one man, Jesus Christ? For just as the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. All that we have 
is through Christ. Through Adam, all men were classified as sin. Or through Christ, all men. You're either in Adam or you're in, you're in Christ. So the actions of Adam and Christ affect the entire world. Spiritual death and eternal separation were passed to all in Adam. Spiritual eternal life passes to all are in Christ. So God sees each person either in Adam or in Christ. So we are either in a spiritual death and eternal separation, or we are in a spiritual eternal life. So Adam or Christ, where do you belong today? Where do you belong today? The word atonement, interesting, just going to do a little bit of uh, Hebrew research here. The word atonement in Hebrew is the word kapar, is spelled K-A-P-P-E-R. And it means the ransom, like I said earlier, this word for ransom and atonement are interchangeable throughout scripture. The, the Old Testament word is kapar. The New Testament Greek word is litrun. So the Hebrew word kapar is formed in three Hebrew letters. So the word for atonement is, is rooted in this word kapar, and it's made up of three Hebrew letters. Those letters are kaf, fe, and resh. Kaf means the palm of the hand, the sole of the foot, and an empty vessel. So when I was looking at this, I was saying, you know, what can this, I, ha I had uh, Ross's little Hebrew uh, book out, which was amazing. And then from that, I just felt the Lord was just saying that, that this word calf, the palm of the hand, the sole of the foot and an empty vessel can represent the sins that we have committed in deed and actions. Those things that we do, those things we do with our hands, those places we go with our feet, that without Christ, we are empty. We are these empty, empty vessels. But it also means that Jesus was nailed through his calf, through his hands, through his feet. And he became of no reputation, like an empty vessel, so that he could take upon himself the sins of the world, the sins of all the ages past, present and future, and on to the age to come. So the first letter of the word atonement is calf. So representing the hands, the feet, the vessel. I'm going to, sh I'll show you a little thingy in a minute, a little diagram. So the hands, the feet, and the empty vessel, the, word, the letter calf represents the sins committed in deeds and actions, things that we do with our hands, things, places we go with, with our, our feet, the things that we do, these actions that we do. And yet it can also, the palm, the hand, the foot, the, the, the empty vessel also can speak of Jesus nailed through his hands and feet. And he became of no reputation to take on the sin of the world, the sin of ages past, present, future, onto the age to come. So you can see right back when they were speaking about the blood sacrifices, the atonement for the sins in Exodus, that they were speaking of this word atonement, this started this letter calf. They were like prophesying right forward. Yes, we are covered in sin, the sins that we do, but actually there is one coming, this prophetic symbolism of one coming who will be nailed through the hands and the feet to do away with the sins that we have committed by action and deed, that he is coming to remove those things and this is like this prophetic symbolism that was put about throughout scripture. This empty vessel, without Christ, we are empty. We're walking in spiritual and physical death day by day. But through the atonement, we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, transformed, made new, rejuvenated with the assurance of life eternal in paradise, heaven, Eden, pleasure, delight, ecstatic joy forevermore. That all comes from like this one little letter at the start of this word atonement. 
that is like the beauty of this language. The word pay, pay, the second letter spelled P-H-E-H, -E speaks of the mouth containing seed. Proverbs 18, 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. So whatever you're going to, whatever it is you love, if you like gossiping about people, you're going to receive that back because there's a fruit of that that's going to come back to your life. Whatever you speak, life or death, empowerment, disempowerment, um, to, to bless someone or to shame someone, it's a seed that goes out from your mouth. And it says, the Bible says that, that you will also take back its fruit. So seed, the seed is what we speak and the seeds bring life and empower or death to disempower, shame or control. James 3 says the tongue is also a fire. What fire controls your life? Is it the human nature, your human nature fire that controls your mouth? What happens when you get angry, when you get irritated, when you're offended? How does what fire comes out of your mouth in those moments? Or is it the fire of the Holy Spirit? that controls what comes out, the seeds that are sent from your inner being. And then seed is also the word of God. Jesus is the word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we have um, calf, which is the hands, the feet, the empty vessel, where all the sins that we've done and actioned are being removed, and also that Jesus was nailed through the hands and the feet, and he became this vessel that took upon him all the sin of the world. Yet without him, we also are that empty vessel, and we cannot control, well, we, we would not without him do good with our hands and the places we go and the actions that we make. And then there's the mouth, the seed, what is it we're planting? What is it that fires our mouth? What is it that 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 fire, that James 1 fire, the tongue is set on fire? What is it? Is it the fire of our humanity that releases seeds to others? Or is it the fire of the Holy Spirit that plants seeds of life, eternal life, that will lead people to Eden? The last letter of the word um, atonement is resh. R-E-S-H. And this last letter of the word atonement means the head, the thoughts, the mindset. And I was thinking about this and I'm like, how does this align up? But when you think like the, the ransom was paid for your ungodly attitudes, for your ungodly thoughts, for your ungodly mindset, which leads to your ungodly thinking and actions and behavior. So this last letter of the word atonement is where God is saying, I am coming, I've come, I've set in precedent, a sacrifice, a ransom that will pay for all your ungodly attitudes and thoughts and mindsets leading to your thinking and your actions and your behaviors. And this ransom is the blood of Jesus Christ that opens the doorway to your repentance. And repentance means to change the way you think, to birth a new mindset. So 1 Corinthians 2 says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he would instruct him? But you, you who know Christ, you have the mind of Christ. So this like, when we think about the letter Resh, we also think of Jesus as the head of the church, and it speaks of his authority, his rule, and his government. It speaks of the thoughts, the intellect, the reason, his thoughts toward us. Psalm 139, more numerous are his thoughts than the sands, the grains of sand. And it reminds us of his thoughts when he was asking the father if there was another way, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, and it said he was his, he was in such a state that his, his sweat was dropping like, like blood, like droplets of blood. He was already shedding his blood in anguish over what was coming. So it reminds us of his thoughts in that place, his agony of mind and body, his mindset 
which was so full of love for the father and determined all the actions that he took, leading him to a brutal death and a glorious resurrection, which we celebrate today. So we look at this calf, fe, resh, the, this word for atonement, the palm of the hand, the sole of the foot, this empty vessel, the, the mouth containing the seed, the resh for the head, the thoughts, the mind. If we put all of that together, what might it look like? What might it look like? It might look like Jesus, the resh, the head of the church, the servant of all, the begotten son of the living God. He carried all authority. He is the living pay, the spoken word, the one who deposits the seeds of life, the sinless one, this beautiful one, this head of all things past, present and future. He chose to be the sacrifice for the guilty for those held by addictions and bondage, for the liars, the thieves, the manipulators, the cheats, the haters, the murderers, the prisoners, the captives, for those held and crippled by disease, those held by sickness, by fear, those in rebellion, those in witchcraft. He chose to be a brutal, bloody sacrifice. He was nailed through the calf, through the palms of his hands, the soles of his feet. In the eyes of the world, he became an empty vessel, but he took on the sin of mankind so that the seeds that come from his mouth, the prophetic and written word, will carry the power of life to change the intellect and the reason of man, bringing about a new mindset, the mind of Christ, a mindset that looks like his own image, his thoughts, his ways, a mindset of surrender, of servanthood, one that recognizes the sacrifice and walks by faith side by side in intimacy with the Father into Eden, into that place of delight and ecstatic joy, into that place of paradise, of living in the heavenly realms, seated in communion with the fullness of all that God is right now. You are seated right now, people. You are seated. If you know Jesus, you are seated already. It is action. The atonement is actioned already in your life. And you have atoned. It is right. You have a, atoned and ransomed legal right to experience all of what is yet to come. You have the right to see with your eyes the wonders of the age yet to come to experience the total ecstasy of his presence. The place of joy and wonder, the place of power of signs, wonders and miracles. You're covered in the power of the atonement. Come on. You have authority to call all that is to come into the realm of our age, into your life and into the lives of all you need. This is the power of atonement. This is the power of atonement. This is why we celebrate that we, through Christ, have overcome the two deaths, eternal, physical, and spiritual. Physical and spiritual, the promises of God through the blood of Christ. Mark 10, 45, we'll finish there. And it says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, as a litrun, as a kopar for many. He laid down his life. He sacrificed all that he had so that, so that we would know the power of resurrection, so that we would know the power of Eden right now here in our lives. You can experience that today, the presence of God, the intimacy of God. If you know him, you're seated with him. You step into that place. The Bible says every time you turn your eyes toward him, it captivates his heart toward you. He focuses on you. It says his eyes are like dove's eyes focused on you. Just like the cherubim over the atonement 
table, that covering. So God is gazing, gazing upon you, gazing upon you. It says in the Song of Songs, you captivate him. His eyes are like doves. And you know, doves, they don't look to the side. They only look ahead. They only look ahead. So when it says that he's gazing on you as you turn to him, it means all his focus, all his focus is upon you. His intimacy, his love is being poured out upon you at that time. The fire of his presence is upon you. When you give your life to Christ, the cherubim open the doorway to the place of his presence. The doorway is opened. It's covered in the blood of Christ. And you can walk through that atonement blood, that atonement power, that resurrected power, right into the courts of heaven, right into the presence of the Father. That is your entitlement today. You're not a slave. You're a son and a daughter of the living God. Come on. Come on. So, Father, as we come to your table today, Lord, we, we remember the power of your resurrection, the power of the atonement, the power of your death, the power of your surrender, the power of your blood, the healing that's in your body, the peace that comes through your presence. And, Lord, we celebrate you today. We celebrate your body, God, broken for us. We celebrate, God, your blood poured out for us. And Lord, as we come to this table that you lie upon and you say, feast upon me, feast upon me, sons and daughters. God, we celebrate today all that you have for us around your table. In Jesus' name, may you be blessed today. May you know the power of the risen Lord resting upon you today. In Jesus' name, amen.